Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Lloyd and I source cars for people on a professional basis. Although most of the cars I source are between £1,000 and £5,000, very often I've been asked to show something a little bit cheaper on the channel and so I came up with No Budget Reviews, the series where we look at cars that you can buy in good condition with an MOT for under a thousand pounds and you can enjoy driving. We don't film this in an expensive manner, we don't use separate microphones, we don't use fluid head tripods, we don't even use a DSLR, but we do have a lot of fun. Picture this scene viewers. It's the early 2000s. You've been a loyal Volvo 240 or 740 owner for about 10 years, but you fancy getting a newer car. What is it that you replace your 240 or 740 with? Well, if you had an estate model, you could probably do a lot worse than buying one of these second generation V70s. First generation V70 and indeed the S70, which was up until um, the year 2000 was based on the Volvo 850. I am hoping to get an 850 in for um, review at some at some point. But um, this is the second generation one, known as the P2 um, V70 by Volvo enthusiasts. This one is. Typical of these, it's been in the same family since new and it was bought from what was called King's Volvo at the time, formerly King's Worthy Volvo, which is where my mother bought her uh, 240 from, an 89 240. In 1990, she kept it till 2001. And uh, Keith, who owns this car, also had a 240, also purchased from King's Volvo. And uh, in 2003, he treated himself to this, brand new. It's a V70 2.4 SE manual with the 170 brake horsepower engine. Classic Volvo design cues, grill, headlamp washers, and best of all, a beige leather interior. Do like a nice beige leather interior viewers. First of all though we're going to go around the back before I get too excited. Now this review's come about at quite short notice um, and so there's not really been a lot of time to have the car sort of cleaned up and things but just so you can see what the boot is like. It's about 485 litres I think if you load this up and it's some enormous capacity if you actually fold the seats. Loan blind isn't, isn't in here, but it was obviously something you get. Um, jack and things are under there. One thing I can't actually remember with this car was whether you could get a seven seat version. I don't think you could, although I might be wrong. I think by the sort of early 2000s, it wasn't really sort of that possible. Instead, you get things like the 12 volt socket here and a sort of compartment for putting the first aid kit in and things like that. Of course we've got a tow bar on this one, uh, my mother's car also had one actually, back in the day. And uh, this car's only done 105,000 miles, so something that's 19 years old, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I think though I need some beige leather interior goodness and so I'm going to have a seat in the back behind myself. The only sort of thing I would know, I would say about this, this is my driving possession, I'm 5 foot 11 and the 240 was also kind of guilty of this. There's really not as much leg room as you'd expect. The headroom's absolutely fine. Um, I can't remember, I think you could get rid of a sunroof, this car doesn't have one. But the seats are sculpted in a way that if you don't have loads of rubbish in here, um, just like a slender map or something, then uh, you could just put your knees in there and you'd be absolutely fine. No problem. Got a armrest in here, uh, no cup holder sadly, but that is very nice and oh, 
Yes, viewers, we've got wood on the door cards too, and the chrome handle, and the famous Volvo sort of head restraints. I must call them that because otherwise people get annoyed with me, viewers. Um, I think those are probably map lights actually. You can turn them on and off individually. Yes, you can. That's pretty good. There's even sort of a tiny bit of space for something in there, although it's not the most useful door pocket I've ever seen. Cigarette lighter or a 12 box socket, I would call it in the back for uh, playing around. I don't know, with like, a, I don't know what would it would have been at the time. Um, and then, like, a Nintendo Game Boy Advance. There we go, viewers. That shows my age. Um, and some vents as well for keeping things nice and cool in the back. I, oh, I could just actually uh, sort of. I slouch a little bit, I could probably fall asleep in here, but I can't because I've got to continue with my exploration of the beige leather interior, which is highly, highly important. It's very easy to get in and out of, actually, this. The seating position seems quite good. Right, here we go into the captain's chair. And the captain is very, very comfortable in here. Um, just pause a second whilst I just close the door, open the window. Right, there we go, viewers. That saves you uh, having to have me sort of change hands and things and have sort of ruffling noises. So, five-speed manual in this car. Uh, I think most of the manuals were a, a five-speed, apart from uh, possibly the R. I think that got a six-speed. Others um, might have done as well. I can't quite remember at the moment. We do have a cup holder that shoots out violently at you if you're not careful for your use of, uh, you know, hot beverages, which has a little sort of rubber fits in it, which are most satisfying to touch. Let's just see if we can get that in. There we go. It's quite a nice mechanism, although shooting out violently is not really, uh, you know, the kind of thing you want on your serene Volvo interior. Cruise control, of course. Um, I think some of the things in here were an option. The SE was originally one step up from the, the base model. It was just called the V70 at launch. Um, but there were many versions of the SE made. In fact, we'll look at them. In my secret mission documents right here, uh, the the uh, SE Lux, the SE Ocean Race, twice, or two different ones, pre and post facelift, the SE Sport, the Special Edition Sport, the SE Plus, uh, the Sport, and then the Tours Lander. I don't know why Volvo thought it necessary to have a Sport, an SE Sport, and a Special Edition Sport. What the difference was between the SE Sport and the Special Edition Sport, I don't know. What I do know is you've got multi-stage heated seats in here. This seat is an electric one for the driver and it is very, very, very comfortable viewers. Very nice. Uh, four disc player. Um, I, I presume whether you did sort of multi-load into this or you, um, there's a, a disc changer and a boot or something. Um, and we've got, yes, manual or automatic on the climber control. Very nice. But I, I will uh, I think probably say later that when you're driving, these are a little bit um, confusing to operate on the move because you've got three different ones of these and they're a little bit tiny. Now, it's nothing like as bad as a modern touchscreen system where you're going to be stabbing away at things and taking your eyes off the road far too much. At least the radio is really good. I mean, the size of the sort of knobs, knobs on there for, for this is really good. I and mean, then just changing the station just involves doing that. And of course, you can just not even have to bother reaching over. You can just do it all on here. Front and rear fog lamps. That um, lighter control, I think, is very similar to the one on an 850 and was used in, on the XC90 first generation until 2014. So it's a case of a spot the Volvo parts bin in here. And that's really no bad thing. I very, very much like all these sort of switches and things and a nice solid handbrake. Um, more cup holders here. You've got some space for loads of things in here. All sorts of manner of things that you can you can plug in and uh, keep a little thing in there as well. Right, let's test out the glove box for secret mission document storage. Okay, viewers, here we go. Let's see if we can do it. No. No! No, viewers. My childhood is shattered. I thought it was going to be the best car ever for secret mission document storage, but 
I was wrong. Never mind. I have to go in there. Right. Let's pause a second while I change hands and we'll switch on the instrument. All right, viewers. There we go. Um, green backlighting, like in so many cars of this sort of era. Trip computer is sort of on here, which I won't fiddle with too much. I'm sure you've seen what a trip computer does before. Um, actually, I'm going to turn this one more notch. See my left hand? Yes, I can. There we go. And it's 280 miles to empty tank. So, so there it is. Let's turn that off. So we don't have the fan going and don't have to have that bonging noise. I'm not very fond of bonging views. Right, I think it's time to have a look at the white block engine. Apologies for the wind noise views. So here it is, 2.4 five cylinder uh, white block engine. In this case generating 170 horsepower. Doesn't look too bad actually in terms of uh, maintenance on this. You do need to make sure on a white block engine that you change the cam belt regularly on it. Low mileage ones can also suffer from uh, noisy tappets. Um, this one doesn't. And uh, just make sure you uh, top up the relevant coolant. Oh, it's green coolant. Interesting, not seen, not seen that in a while. Yeah, looks all, it's all pretty straightforward in here. And uh, just so you can have a bit more headlamp wiper action. Right, time to go for a little spin. Oh, viewers, what a treat once again to be back in beige leather interior land. It certainly feels like the kind of car if you had a 240 and you wanted something that was as similar as possible to that having driven one and you know as as I said before my mother had one from 1990 to 2001 that you would feel very at home in. The ride is, is pretty good over these less than desirable surfaces uh, just on the edge of Southampton here and this, uh, this engine is really smooth. It's known as the white block engine or the Volvo modular engine. There are different names people have for these. This is the 2.4 litre version. It's a five cylinder engine. The white block came in four, five and six cylinder versions. All V70s of this P2 type have the five cylinder white block engines. The range started with a 140 brake horsepower version of, uh, of this engine. I don't think it was sold actually all the way through production like this car might, might be wrong. Um, and that generated 140 horsepower. It's actually technically 138 but I call it 140 because well it's easier for me to remember these round numbers. This car has the 170 brake horsepower version of the engine. Neither of those are uh, turbocharged, they're actually normally aspirated engines. The turbo started at uh, 2 litres, now there was I think a, I think 160 brake horsepower version of this engine, I don't think it was sold in this country though. The ones we got started at 180 horsepower, later 177 I think um, from about 2004-05, I think it changed part of the way through. And then we get up to the more exciting engine, shall we say. The uh, 2.4 turbo, that's 200 horsepower. Later that was a 2.5 turbo with uh, 210 horsepower. Then we get into the T5s. T5s first of all started off with a uh, 250 horsepower engine. Then later that was changed for a 260. Remember, really rip snorting. V70R with 300 horsepower in an all wheel drive system. There are also some, <clears throat> some diesels available, 
But as usual, due to controversial government legislation and all kinds of other reasons, we don't talk about diesels on this channel. What we do talk about is um, some rather nice and smooth riding engineering. Brakes feel very positive, of course you'd expect that from a Volvo. This seat is exceptionally comfortable. Controls are, are pretty easy, but the heated ventilation is a little bit fiddly, it's a little bit smaller than I would like, but there are a lot of settings for it. It's got dual zone climate control, this car, of course. About driving the car, the only thing I would say is that the clutch and gearbox do feel considerably heavier than I thought they would. I don't know why that is. Um, not a problem particularly. I mean, a lot of people went for the auto um, with these V70s, so maybe that's something to investigate if that's a problem. But if you're the sort of person who likes to uh, actually feel what's going on, then that might be a good option. Certainly with uh, VR models, you could actually get a manual version even of those, uh, which might be worth considering if you really need to go very, very fast. I'm not sure the fuel economy in these is uh, the best. You might get, I don't know, 30 miles per gallon on a long run in one of these. I don't really want to look at, you know, um, the fuel computer in here particularly. I don't think really that um, that's going to do me any favours. You can of course run any of any of these on E10, any of the petrol ones. That's no problem. Obviously, if you have got one of the you know, T5 or VR ones, you might want to consider using um, premium just for that reason. Um, but overall, the best option for those who maybe are on a, a more uh, limited budget and don't want to go for a forbidden fuel car, which I understand why you wouldn't want to. So maybe consider one of the bi-fuel versions. They were both from the 138 brake horsepower uh, 2.4 normally aspirated engine. And uh, you could have either an LPG or a CNG version. I don't know uh, whether we got both of those in this country or whether we just got one of them. I, I don't actually remember at the moment, but that might be something worth seeking out if you want to uh, these absolutely crazy petrol prices. Lloyd Consulting stickers, t-shirts and mugs are available by clicking the link to the Google form in the video description below. I can't tell you how nice it is to drive a car like this. Sure, the controls are a bit heavier than a lot of modern cars. There's no electric power steering or anything in this. But I quite like that. I quite like the feeling of this car. It just feels so solid and well-engineered and everything's very deliberate. And although it's got a lot of, you know, safety aids in it, and that was one of the reasons why people bought these back in the day. It doesn't feel sort of overly encumbered by things like that. And I like the sound of the five-cylinder engine. I like the feel of the steering. It does roll a bit, but you know, if you if you really wanted to eliminate that, you could get, you know, a T5 or an, or an R or something like that. Even got an electrochromatic rear view mirror in this, so very fancy. You can see why you know Keith and his family have kept this car for so long. 105,000 miles when it's done, they don't really seem to show very much. There's not even really anywhere on this seat. I have to say, I'm quite tempted myself to get one of these, but the only problem really with it is the stupid fuel prices at the moment. It's not the E10 and things like that, and you can get ones of these that will go in a, in a congested, sorry, not a congested charge zone, not sure emission zone. 
I think um, this has the slightly later version of the 2.4 170 brake horsepower engine, which means that it's Euro 4 compliant. I've obviously checked that, but that's obviously a, a factor these days too. But it's just, just the fact that in 2003, it was about 84p a litre for petrol. I remember very well filling up my Mazda 323 at the time. But now with fuel prices at about £1.75 a litre, it, it's just a little bit more of a serious issue is to have a, a big car like this. But people absolutely love these V70s, the first two generations in particular. And I really like this car. I'm really grateful to have had a go in this. And um, I hope that uh, it gives Keith and his family many, many years more reliable motoring. I've just realised here is that I uh, fit in very nicely with the beige leather interior. I wonder why that is. Anyway, uh, the P2 Volvo V70. Is this something that you should uh, consider with your hard-earned budget of up to £1,000? I'm amazed that you can still buy these for that sort of money. I saw one with a bit higher mileage than this one, probably not as quite as nice as condition as this one. For 995 at a dealership in Wokingham the other day. And so they are still firmly within that territory. I'd advise you to pay a bit more for one. Uh, this car is definitely worth a, a bit more than a thousand pounds, I would say, particularly with the fact it's still got the original dealer plates on it and it's been in the same family from new, obviously full service history and all that sort of thing. Um, they drive sort of like a, a kind of 240 does in a way. Obviously, it's front wheel drive. You could get an all wheel drive version. And, and uh, yes, even the, the sort of, um, cross country um, version, which is later renamed to the XC70. Um, but yeah, front wheel drive, same platform and engineering as the Volvo S60 and uh, you know elements with the S80 and the XC90 as well. So pleasurable to drive, although the the clutch and gear change are a little bit heavy to just bear that in mind. Lots and lots of space, um, the boot's not quite as big as one of those old 240s or 740s, so uh, just be just be aware of that, but probably big enough for most people's needs. And really nice and relaxing to drive, feels very powerful and muscular um, in that sort of traditional Volvo way. Um, got to watch the you know, cam belts on these engines, there can be electrical faults, the automatic gearbox can give problems, but generally they're, they're pretty reliable cars actually. Anyway, thank you ever so much indeed for watching this episode of No Budget Reviews. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video and uh, leave a comment below. And uh, we'll see you again soon for more inexpensive motoring.